Hi, you're listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Hayes, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Christy Hollywood. Christy leads Hollywood and Associates, providing strategy, capture, and purposeful advisory services. Christy's TPAPMP brings 25 years of capture-related experience in federal and commercial markets. Previously, Christy led and oversaw capture teams at KPMG, RTI International, Noblis, Cardno International Development, and PART. A long-time APMP member, she also participates in the Strategy and Competitive Intelligence Professional SKIP, AFCEA, and Project Management Institute. Christy holds a BA from University of Virginia and an MBA from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She lives in Annapolis with her family. Christy's interests and hobbies include reading, cooking, hiking, kayaking, and traveling. So there is a lot to talk about. Christy, welcome to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Bhaskar. I'm glad to be here. Let's go back to the very beginning. Where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and education. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in a small town surrounded by cows and corn. We lived on Main Street. Two blocks away was the local pharmacy that had a soda fountain counter. <laughs> so it was this idyllic kind of idyllic kind of Norman Rockwell place to grow up. Um, mm. Right on the Mason Dixon line. High school. Um, I co-edited the paper while there, and it was a pretty traditional high school experience, lots of uh, 1990s clicks, uh, that sort of thing. But I had my my small group and helped out with the hockey team that went to state finals, And but editing the paper was my, my big focus the last year or two that I was there. Mm. Other than editing, for, editing papers and helping your team in hockey, do you have any other pleasant childhood memories growing up? <laughs> so many <laughs> we we hosted a lot of foreign exchange students growing up which was really unusual because it was a small town about an hour outside of baltimore mm. and so we had exchange students come from honduras for one year we had uh, a guy from france come over his spring break and then I worked at Hardee's one summer to pay for a plane ticket to go spend part of the summer in France with his family. Uh, So that was, that was really fun. And my parents still joke to this day that when, when we hosted exchange students and mom took a Chinese cooking class. So we were like the only people in town who were making food in a walk back then. Uh, They joked that they didn't think I would take it this far and get, get deep into international development work. Um, or always insist that we go out to a different ethnic restaurant when they come to visit. So, <laughs> wow, that's that's very interesting. I think that sort of cultural exchange, foreign exchange, um, at a very early age, uh, does make a massive difference to understand that the world is beyond our little town or our little village or a city that we grow up. That's very nice. No, it's so, true, and and I think that mm-hmm. it it gives you new perspective um, on your your own life and your own culture. So it's it's been really useful. Definitely, Christy. And from then on, you moved to University of Virginia for your Bachelor of Arts. What did you study there? I studied foreign affairs and Russian studies. The Soviet wow. Union collapsed while I was there. Uh, right. So I did not get a job at the State Department. They had hiring freezes for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was a great place to go to school. Um, I had been kind of one of one of the smart kids in my high school and in college, everybody was brilliant. Um, so it was, it was a place where you could just have fun and not worry about really how people saw you. Mm. And that was really refreshing. Um, and I've been lucky to 
over the course of my career and where we've lived, be able to be surrounded by really bright people that keep me engaged and keep me learning new things. Totally. Foreign affairs and Russian studies. Um, do you still remember any Russian? <laughs> Uh, no, I remember most of my Hungarian because while I was there, I did a study abroad in Pech in Hungary. Um, got it. So I had to learn a little Hungarian too, but Russian, I really struggled with, honestly. Most of the kids in my, my first year classes at UVA, right. Russian, had had mm. Russian in high school and I had done five years of Spanish. Wow. So I was a bit behind the curve. So I never quite caught up. I got my very first C's in my life in Russian. <laughs> that, I think it's amazing. I think, right? yeah, that, that's great. I mean, like learning any language at whatever the level always comes with its own advantage. But the, I mean, it's, it's hard to keep up language anyway, Christy, isn't it? We study for four or five years, but if you yeah. don't use it, you lose it so quickly. Well, and I used it when I first graduated for a while, but I remember Spasiva and Pajalsta. Mm. <laughs> and Nichevo. <laughs> so if you ask me if I gavri gavri praruski, I'll say Nichevo. No, I really don't. So right. Whatever you said now, it's uh, it sounded great. <laughs> Please and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay, good. Listeners learned at least two new things today. That's good. So once you finish uh, finished your bachelor's in Virginia, did you went on to do an MBA immediately or did you take any roles in between? Um I Definitely took roles in between. Both of my parents um, were school teachers growing up. So mm -hmm. I had taken on student loans to do my undergrad and was not really in a position to go straight to a master's. So I moved to DC and took a job with international consulting company as a project assistant. So I was basically a glorified secretary um, mm -hmm. reporting to four different people uh, about my first or second month there, one of them had just come back from being overseas for a long time and had a nervous breakdown. Mm. And it was an ugly nervous breakdown where I was, I was working to help finish a proposal. And he wanted me to type up his Rolodex because this was back in the 90s when people still had paper Rolodexes. So he was getting really agitated about it, uh, that I wasn't doing it right then and was saying I could do it tomorrow after we finished the bid. So one of my other managers came out and had a conversation and it just kept escalating. Um, and it ended up, they had to call the police. And for the mm -hmm. next couple of days, they had armed guards on my floor, but we got the bid done. I stayed calm. Things were fine. Um, but it definitely made a name for me and the organization as somebody who could kind of keep their cool under pressure and still get things done. And that paid off in a big way because the company was growing as about the hundredth person they had hired in this, this uh, division of KPMG. And by the time I left, we were over 300 people. And so that gave me a lot of opportunities. So I was in that administrative role for about six months and then moved on to one of their largest projects, which was working with the NIS monetary restructuring project, a big USAID project to work with the former Soviet Union independent states about how to structure their banking systems, do privatization and set up tax schemes. So it was this huge mammoth project working with teams in multiple different countries and I basically provided logistical and administrative support and edited documents in Russian <laughs> and Ukrainian. Um, and that was a really fun experience working with these remotely distributed teams and then still getting pulled into other proposal efforts. So over time, I actually set up their first centralized proposal center and knowledge management center, uh, which is what I did until I left so about five years after I had started, but it was a really great growth experience. Wow. I mean, like, uh, I think we all land on this profession in different ways, but it looks like you had a, you had a straight entry point and it took you all the way. <laughs> I mean, like, you're super blessed. Almost. I mean, I was just looking for anything that touched on international when I graduated college mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there wasn't, there wasn't a lot. And even in later years, I would find people who had had those great uh, Russian Intel analysts or Russian State Department analyst jobs, 
and they all got laid off about that time. So there have been organizations I've worked at since where like half of the people there had been Russia specialists mm -hmm. <laughs> and there just wasn't a huge demand anymore. Wow, that's brilliant. So, uh, so KPMG, uh, after that, uh, let's talk us through your career timeline all the way up until your current role as president of Hollywood Associates. Ah, okay. Uh, so KPMG, after several years, I was realizing that I probably didn't want to do that, that type of work anymore because most of the women there that, well, most of the people there, you would find out that you're going to go overseas in two days and, oh, it was going to be for a six month stint. Mm. So the effect on people's personal lives there was just really harsh. Um, we saw marriages fall apart. We saw there's one, one of my friends went overseas. She was about 35 at the time. And she's like, I had this great date before I left and it's been six months. So I don't think I can call him back now. Um, and I, I didn't know if that exactly was what I wanted for my life, just always being on the go and not being able to have a, a strong home base. So I moved to Baltimore. Uh, which had been the big city to me growing up. But after living in DC, it wasn't so much. Um, and got a job at T. Rowe Price, uh, working in their proposal shop and basically coordinating all the workflow and setting up their database of responses uh, for retirement plan administration. Um, and I served on, <laughs> it was Y2K. So there was a crisis communications committee about Y2K that I served on there. And it was a good job. People were nice. It was a great place to be. I was nearby when one of my grandmothers passed away so I could visit her often. Um, but it wasn't, I was bored, honestly. It wasn't a challenge. So I made a pro con list of everywhere I had ever lived and what I liked and didn't like about those places. And when I looked at the, the qualities of the places I had lived that I liked the most, it looked like it was telling me to move to Boston, where I'd only ever spent a weekend. So... <laughs> So I flew up to Boston several times to kind of check it out. I had one friend from college living up there and decided I moved to Boston. I got a job temping um, at what I referred to as an insurance firm of the dead. Uh, so it was a, uh, what did they actually do? It was an estate law practice. And then uh, looked for, look for a real job. And I got a job working at Fidelity Investments, which was great. My first job there was working on the mutual fund reports that go to the board of directors, the board of trustees that provide oversight. So I was working with the actual fund managers. So like the biggest fund in the country at the time and the guy running that, I was working with the junk bond managers who knew all the international ins and outs, which was really fun to talk with them and be able to translate what they were trying to say into words that could be easily understood and not misconstrued and address all those unanswered questions that the board was going to have. So they would have to go once a year before the board and explain their fund's performance, what risks were coming up and why they did well or didn't. So it was kind of like preparing for an orals presentation. And I, I did probably about a dozen or two dozen of these each month. And so I got really good at anticipating what questions might be asked, looking under the numbers and figuring out what angles may we not have covered that could come up and throw the fund manager off their feet if an unexpected question came up. So they were very well prepared when they went in. And that was, that's something that I still use to this day, um, especially when prepping for orals. So I was there for a couple of years and then they opened a spot they opened a, another part of the organization at Fidelity to work on equity stock option compensation. Well, equity stock purchase plans, ESPPs, equity stock purchase plans, where basically companies allow employees to buy stock as part of their compensation. So they were doing outsourcing of that, kind of like they outsource 401k administration or HR aspect administration. 
So I talked to that group and basically they were having issues because it was a new product. The product was being developed very rapidly with multiple releases. And the sales team was selling gangbusters, but they were tending to sell things that were going to be developed instead of what was actually available. So my job when I went in, officially I was running the proposal shop that hadn't existed. So I built a proposal shop, got a database of answers together, which is the best way to deal with the Q&A proposals they had on the commercial side. And basically negotiated between sales and IT and operations about what we could sell when, how much of it we could actually sell, and then documented all of that in our database. So the Q&A database for the proposal became basically the authority on what we actually had available at any given point. And it was really great. And then we were also able to, when we started getting results and metrics in, I was able to provide input to the sales team looking at where we were winning, where we were losing and why. So we could see, for example, that at the smaller firms, kind of the equivalent of a high net worth individual account, but it was a small firm with maybe like 10, 20, 100 people being able to buy in, we weren't doing very well. So we did a competitive analysis and figured out how to better position in that submarket. So that was really fun. Um, but then I lived in a fourth floor walk up in a really fun part of town. And my dog uh, had a Dalmatian mix at the time. She hurt her back and couldn't get up the stairs anymore. And about the same time, we'd had two feet of snow overnight. And while my neighbors who worked in the suburbs were like, come over for hot cocoa, we're going to be shoveling out the cars and then just hanging out by the fireplace. I had to go to work because the buses were running on time because <laughs> Boston, the city can deal really well with that much snow. And I found that really frustrating because I grew up in Maryland where if you get two inches of snow, you're, you're, you're staying home. It's great. It's snow day. So I was thinking about moving. And so when my dog hurt her back. I'm like, Okay, so I ran her, I rented a car, drove the dog down to my parents' farm because they had moved to Southern Virginia while I was in college, left my dog with my parents, stopped in DC on the way back to Boston and found an apartment, went back to Boston, gave two weeks notice at Fidelity and then moved back to DC. Um, so that was fun and interesting. <laughs> and I was still untethered enough. I could pull that off really quickly. When I was moving back, I had sent, I was sending out my, my fidelity email will no longer work. You can contact me at email. And one of my friends from DC who had been someone I worked with my very first job, she had done the contracts and pricing part of uh, that big uh, monetary restructuring project in the former Russian states. And she is like, oh, you have to talk to me and my friend. We just started a company and we need somebody just like you. And I said, okay, I'll have lunch thinking, yeah, this is crazy. So I had set up a couple other interviews with some of the big, like Lockheed Martin, I know was one that I had an interview with. And I'd scheduled that interview for the day after I was meeting Molly Gimmel. Uh, she and Diana Dibble had set up a company called Design to Delivery in Bethesda. And I had lunch with them. And basically they wanted somebody to help their clients with capture, to do teaming arrangements and to help actually uh, sell their company to clients. And it sounded fun. They had enough of a base of business they could afford me. And so I canceled my interview at Lockheed and took that job and got to work with people that I loved. And it was really fun for a couple of years. Um, at the same time, I was realizing that I was approaching 30, probably couldn't afford a house in DC, much less an apartment in D like a condo in DC. And my younger brother um, had been going through a bit of a rough patch and was living in North Carolina at the time. So I'm like, well, why don't I see if I can get a job in North Carolina? I can afford a house in North Carolina, um, even as a single person. So I applied for a couple jobs. Um, and I got a job at RTI International. They had a tremendous proposal shop, uh, one of the best run ones I'd ever seen that David Sotolongo was running. And they wanted somebody to come in and work with that division to really build out their capture and account management pieces 
all the pre-proposal stuff. So that's what I was hired to do. And that was a super fun job. Oh my gosh. Um, I got to do all the fun parts and work with crazy, brilliant people. Almost everybody there has a PhD. And I also had a great executive coach while I was there. In addition to having David Sotolongo as my boss, he was tremendous. Like one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from him where he's like, you work too much. That was the one thing in all my reviews, you work too much. So really trying to push that work-life balance. Whereas in, earlier in my career, like that first job I had, uh, part of KPMG, we all showed up on Saturday because the senior, the senior management was there and you had to have at least your face seen briefly on Saturday, even if you didn't have much to do. It was kind of twisted. Um, so really unlearning that was a major part <laughs> of being in North Carolina and working with David. Um, and it was, it was fun. It was really fun. Um, and then I had just started dating my husband when I took the job at RTI. So we did long distance because he was still in DC. And when we got married, he moved down to North Carolina. And we had decided that if either of us was kind of getting iffy about work, we would move back to DC where there were more options. He's a policy analyst. So DC is where the jobs are too. And things got iffy. And so we were driving to Vermont for a friend's wedding. And by the time we hit New York state, we had decided we're moving back to DC. Uh, even though it meant we would probably only have one kid instead of maybe three that we had talked about. Um, and by the time we hit Vermont, we had a, a game plan in place, how we were going to, what we were going to do in DC, where we were probably going to live, all this stuff that was, it was done. So it's a very productive drive. Uh, when we moved back to DC, I ended up moving to Noblis, um, which at the time was still finishing its rebranding from being MITRE Tech. They were spin off of MITRE a few years before I joined. And they had fired their head of proposal development. So I came in to try to pick up the pieces <laughs> and relaunch that shop, which was getting to be a bit of a theme in my career. I was starting things up or doing turnarounds. So I came in, uh, I, I reported to, I think she was the VP of BD above me and she did a lot of special projects. So I ended up reporting to the executive committee pretty regularly on pipeline and other initiatives and basically restructured the way they were doing their proposals and put it in terms that the staff there who are most mostly systems engineers um, working on acquisition support um, and then some engineers who are working on in intel forensics um, transportation science those kind of things Put it in engineering terms. So we basically look, they all use PMI. So we basically took a fairly standard Shipley process, put it in terms that were based around PMI speak and lingo and piloted it with some of the most recalcitrant people who had hated the, the last proposal management shop so that we could really address their concerns. They would feel heard. And they ended up being some of our biggest champions. And so that was tremendous. So the proposal shop was turned around. We, they had one capture going on for their major contract. And they had another con capture going on for one of their smaller contracts with FAA was being consolidated in with 11 other contracts to a large FAA ECSS bid. And all the capture work they had done was talk to one of the senior people at FAA who was about to retire before the solicitation came out. So I talked, and the president of the company was the one having these conversations. And so I basically said, Okay, well, that's a good thing to do, but he's going to be gone. How much influence does he actually have on what's going to come out? And we need to really come up with good reasons they're going to choose us over these. There were nine other incumbents on these 12 contracts. So 
we had less than six months to get ready. So we basically hired two capture managers full time, one for each of those efforts to really go hard and deep and make sure that our bids were going to be pretty much ironclad. So we did robust black hats. We did preliminary versions of the solution and staffing mixes and reviewed those. And we won both, basically doubling the contract, the annual contract value of the company or the contract base of the company. So we doubled the contract base of the company with those two wins. So that was great. Um, one of the challenges at Noblis at the time was one of the division heads I referred to as a bulldog, which is not a bad thing. He was, he was brought in to be a rainmaker for his division and he wanted things done his way all the time, even though it didn't really jive with what we we're doing for everyone else. And for his division, I was fine, but he was advocating for us to do it his way for everything. And I basically spent a good part of my time just protecting my staff uh, from, from some of his efforts. And it really ground me down. Um, when I gave notice, the president of the company asked what he could do to make me stay. Like he scheduled a meeting with me and sat me down and asked, because I liked working with most of the staff there and was doing great things. But I was honest when I answered him, I'm like, we really can't do anything that would be in the interest of the company because you need this division leader to grow that division. You can replace me. Um, so I left there and started Hollywood and Associates. Um, I put out a couple dream job resumes. Um, one of those was at PATH, which is a large health-related nonprofit doing a lot of work on the international sphere. When I did my MBA at Carolina, I had actually convinced one of my project teams there to do a whole report <laughs> on PATH. Um, and their innovative design of technology. They were a huge beneficiary of Gates funding over the years, and they had been trying to grow their US government funding as a way to diversify from, from Gates funding almost exclusively and to keep their independent status from Gates because they're just getting so much funding. It's like over a billion dollars over 10 years just from the Gates Foundation. So, after starting Hollywood and Associates and doing little bits and pieces of work for people, um, I got a job offer from PATH. Um, one of the things I didn't get in writing was the position was discussed as kind of a deputy director of the proposal shop. And they had brought back one of their, their star business development folks who had set up two in-country offices, tremendous intuitive BD person to lead the shop. And she was great. Um, but I didn't get in writing that I was going to be the deputy director. And at the same time, uh, I became pregnant with our daughter. And after I came back from maternity leave, one of the first meetings we had was that it was a flat hierarchical stru structure. Everybody was the same in the proposal shop. The folks who were fresh out of school and those of us with like a decade or more experience, all the same. And I'm like, okay, that's different than what I had agreed to, but okay. And then I went on an international trip um, when my daughter was four months old and I cried every night I was there. I mean, it was a great trip work-wise. Um, we trained, I forget how many, I think several hundred Ethiopian nonprofits on how to go after uh, grants from USAID. And it, it's a beautiful country. Um, but after I talked to my family every night, I would just cry because I was a new mom. It was hard. So when I got back, uh, we had conversations at home about, okay, this is not going to work out for, for long-term working at PATH. And so I called some of my friends over at Shipley. I knew several people from working at RTI. 
Um, I knew several, I knew a lot of people from APMP. And so I spoke to Nancy Kessler. Uh, she called me back to kind of interview me to be a Shipley consultant. And she basically said, she's like, oh, she wasn't asking me questions. She was, she wanted just to talk. And I'm like, like, don't you have any questions about my experience or any of this? And she's like, oh no. She's like, I talked to David Sotolongo. You're fine. You'll do great. And I was like, that was such a confidence booster. I cannot tell you. Um, and so that really gave me the courage to go out on my own again and also consult with Shipley. Uh, and so that's really how Hollywood and Associates started is when I left PATH and it became a really big push to grow a company that would be able to tailor standard processes in ways that would really resonate with people across that organization and help them win work. And so that's really been the bulk of what I've done in the, I guess, 11 years now since. Uh, with with a brief interlude going in-house at a client at Cardno for a couple of years. Wow. What a fascinating journey. Thank you for taking us to, I think literally, I'm sure I was literally going with you in the journey in the car with your brother all the way. <laughs> 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 Whatever that happened, I'm sure listeners can also, uh, you know, go through with you on this journey. Thank you for sharing in such a detailed manner, uh, Christy. point in your career did you come across APMP and do you have any fond memories of uh, your first Bitcoin or presenting in Bitcoins because you have been an avid contributor to the community for a long time now? Yeah. Um, I first learned about APMP when I was up in Boston working at Fidelity and I was, I think I was Googling to see what was out there about setting up proposal shops because I'd done it several times and I'm like, but there has to be some documentation somewhere. And I came across um, APMP, I guess it was like maybe 1998 or so. And I'm like, oh, they wrote this all down. This is brilliant. And so I joined APMP uh, with the Northeaster chapter. I didn't actually go to any of the meetings, I don't think, which is strange. But I remember just feeling comforted. There are lots of other people in the industry, even in Boston. Um, and that there were people I could reach out to if I had questions. Um, so that was good. And then when I moved back to the DC area, the national capital area chapter is just huge and massive and you have to be engaged if you're in the area. You can't, I mean, it's hard to avoid <laughs> if you're in the business <laughs> and that's a good thing. Um, so APMP BidCon, I got started presenting because when I was at RTI years later, um, one of the things that, that David Sotolongo told me when I came on board was that in order to really have any sort of stature within the organization and be taken seriously by all these folks who had PhDs, one, I would have to at least get a master's degree in something. And two, I would have to publish or present. And I'm like, Okay, <laughs> so we kind of walked through some options on those. Um, and so that's why I started submitting uh, to present at APMP bid cons, which has been good. My most memorable one, well, I think was my last one. And I don't, I don't know if the presentation came off that well, but it was supposed to be a workshop around tailoring capture for a given a given opportunity, like really how to take the full, the full enchilada process and slim it down to still be as impactful as possible, but, but doable, even if you aren't a huge company and how you slim it down varies based on the specifics of any given bid. So we kind of had like a flow chart pick list um, that we had developed um, for real world capture training. That's what we call it. Uh, and it's usually a full day class and we kind of boiled down the essence of it to this hour long presentation workshop where people are going to actually work through some scenarios at their tables. We were anticipating 60 people. 
we had over 150. It was standing room only. So the whole workshop modality just wasn't working. Um, but just that that many people were interested <laughs> was crazy. Um, not crazy, but it was like just really jaw dropping to me because normally I got a handful of people are really interested in the things that I'm, I'm doing. And it was, it was just really nice to see that many people. And I think I really need to go back and restructure it for a broader crowd in a way that would work. Um, because the workshop mode did not work with that many people. <laughs> um, and I, I just really got to the point of loving catching up with people at BidCons because you always see some of the familiar faces, you always meet new and interesting people. Mm. Mm. Definitely. I think uh, we did host David Sartlongo and a few other colleagues from RTI in the past. I mean, like it's, uh, it's just great. It's great to see. I might have seen you in Boston or uh, in, in the later mm -hmm. conference, Christy, but it is, it is great. But, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage to stand up on the stage and share what you learned and then give it back to the community. But thank you for all your contributions. So before I hand over you to Ashley for the rapid random fire question drone or what we call in honors of nutters round in how would <laughs> not. So tell us three things not many people know about you. Uh, um, okay, mostly silly things that people don't know about me. So I will go almost anywhere to be able to dance badly with my husband. Um, we had taken jitterbug lessons before I got pregnant and we were jitterbugging in the hospital to speed up labor. It was fun. Um, but yeah, I will, I will go pretty much anywhere to go dance with my husband. Um, I own way too many books. The last time we moved, we had over 35 boxes of books. Um, and I, I really love being out in a canoe on the water, uh, which is one of the big reasons we moved to Annapolis, but yeah. Got it. Nice. I'll, uh, I think um, uh, Ashley will take it further from here. Thank you so much, Christy. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, that's a great transition over to our uh, surprise rapid fire questions round. Before we get into the rapid fire, let's talk a little bit more about your hobbies and interests. Um, obviously, reading is one of those and being on the water. Um, any others? Uh, I love travel. I love exploring new cultures. Um, we have a long list of places we want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I have a long list of places I want to take my husband and daughter back to where they haven't been yet. Um, I like to cook. I don't, oh. I don't like having to cook like daily meals, but I like to have like a day just to like mess around in the kitchen and try new recipes. And sometimes they work and sometimes it's really good to have a frozen pizza on hand. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So where are the top five places on that long list of places you'd like to go? <laughs> <laughs> um, my daughter was reminding me that we promised to take her to Ireland, a trip that had been postponed due to COVID. So Aww. she was reminding me of that just yesterday. Yeah. Um, we want to go. I hear so many good things about Zanzibar. I work with a lot of people who have done long stints in Africa and Zanzibar comes up time and time again. They're in Cape Town or supposedly two spots you just have to see in Africa. Um, I want to go somewhere to see rice terraces. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> it's weird. Uh, one of my old roommates, uh, her family was from the Philippines. And so every time she would go visit her cousin, she'd come back with these pictures of the rice terraces and they're just beautiful. It's kind of like where yeah. I grew up, we had like a patchwork on the hills of the strip farming. Uh -huh. um, but the rice terraces are just a whole nother level. Yeah. Um, wow. I know, I know. Um, I saw the pyramids in Egypt, so that one's done. Mm. Um, I would love, I'd love to spend some more time in Kenya or South Africa, um, getting out into the countryside, um, not just doing the work stuff. Uh, that would be fun. Yeah. I wanted to take my mom on a safari because she loves giraffes. I think that would be cool. And Switzerland, I just, for some reason, I've always wanted to go to Switzerland and I've never been. 
Oh my gosh, lots of really cool places and just <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's pivot over to kind of the surprise rapid fire question rounds. Uh, no right or wrong answer, whatever comes first to mind, or if you want to pass, we can pass. No worries about that. Okay. Okay. Um, so, which superhero would you want to be and why? There's so many in the Marvel Universe. <laughs> yeah, my husband's been trying to get me steeped. Um, oh, what is her name? So, I wouldn't want her backstory because that is just sad. Um, but I think, is it the Scarlet, the Scarlet Witch in the Marvel Universe? She's just tremendously powerful and, and can create change when she wants to. Oh. Um, yeah. And, and there was a little mini series where she had unintentionally done it after her husband died. Um, but I think, I think that would just be kind of cool powers to have. Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds like a good one for sure. Mm-hmm. What is the most courageous thing you've ever done? <laughs> Depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> my my parents think the most courageous thing I've ever done was moving to Boston without a job in the middle of a mini recession. Um, it did not strike me as brave at the time. <laughs> um, what else? I think starting starting my own company. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like taking that leap. Yeah. And I will say having gone through the MBA program at Chapel Hill really made me much better equipped to do it. Mm. Um, like I actually had run the financials and everything before I even thought about starting. Smart. <laughs> Not many. <laughs> I can, well, I don't know. I can't speak for everybody, but it sounds like something, you know, some people might, might start without that. <laughs> yeah. I don't advise starting without that. I also advise having at least three to six months in the bank, um, just mm -hmm. so you don't panic. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I think that's one of the most daunting things about going independent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if given a chance, who would you like to be for a day? I don't know. I'd like to be me on vacation for a day. Oh, right. I agree. <laughs> I mean, I think we've really, we've really shifted our lives around during COVID so that when we're not busy, life is actually fairly good. Um, so yeah, me on vacation. Love it. Um, so you're chosen to make dinner for a very special guest. Who would you invite and what would you cook? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would invite all of the folks I call my friend family. Um, so, so my pseudo brother, Ben, who lives out in Boulder, um, his best bud, Andy and his family, they live in Northern Virginia now. Um, my, my, my daughter's two honorary, well, three honorary aunts and their families. Mm -hmm. And I think Oh, we'd have to have, it has to be in the backyard because we don't have enough room in the house. Um, <laughs> yeah, There's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that will affect the menu choices. Um, probably, I'd probably try to do some like big chili because that's mm -hmm. fairly easy to do for that many people. And then yeah. lots of really interesting side dishes, so like go crazy with the vegetable dishes and desserts and definitely Bye. have Mississippi mud pie because the two, the two, the two, the two guys on that list, uh -huh. um, we used to do, <laughs> we used to do, um, I forget what we called them, but they're, they're like specialty dinners because mm -hmm. they, they had never had crabs before they moved to the district <gasps> of Columbia. Yeah. Oh my so gosh. <laughs> I was the one. So for those not on the East coast, Maryland, Chesapeake Bay, blue crabs, you steam them and put lots of, um, cayenne pepper and other spices on them, old Bay. Um, and then you eat them with your hands and break open the shells with mallets. It's, it's messy and really gross if you're not used to it, but I grew up with it. So it's awesome. So I was the one who always brought that. So they like, they knew I had lots of weird food in my, <laughs> my family. <laughs> 
so we did like food of our people meals. So yeah. I did a German meal for them. Ben did Armenian food one, one time. And then I'm like, okay, what do you want me to make? And they're like Southern food. And I'm like, okay, what is Southern food? And they're like <laughs> chicken fried steak. I'm like, I have never eaten chicken fried steak in my life. <laughs> So, so I forget what all I made, I made green. So I had collards mm -hmm. and a friend of mine from Georgia made a sweet potato casserole for me. Cause hers has like four sticks of butter in it. It's just like <laughs> insane. I made bisque. I think I made ham biscuits using my aunt's recipe. I got some moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> Family used to have a connection um, yeah. and Mississippi mud pie. So oh my gosh. Mississippi mud pie. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, who haven't you seen or talked to in a while and hope they're doing okay? Uh, that's probably a long list. Um, I have a couple of friends who I know are going through stuff and we're trying to touch base regularly. And if I haven't heard from them in two weeks, I worry. Um, mm -hmm. They're good, but I just worry. Um, yeah. I have two two family friends, like they're my parents' age, um, whose husbands recently passed away that mm -hmm. I need to, I need to go visit, honestly. Yeah. Um, let's see, happier ones. <laughs> so I like, I was just reaching out to two, to the two honorary aunts, two of the honorary aunts, because we used to do girls weekends, like at least mm -hmm. once a year. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, we need something on the calendar for spring. Um, yeah. So that, that one's happening. Um, and then I have a good friend from college who lives in Richmond who, who I need to talk to. Oh. Yeah. So you mentioned liking to play around in the kitchen and sometimes you have some fails and it's good to have some pizzas on hand. So what is your most memorable <laughs> kitchen fail? <laughs> um, I was, oh, this is probably a while ago because my nephew is now like 24. Um, <laughs> when he was about 12, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think I'm remembering this right. Um, actually, no, he, he did it himself, but it was exactly the same thing I did. Okay. So we were going on a camping trip when I was like in high school. And so I made brownies because desserts or baked desserts were my thing when I was in high school. I could make those in lasagna and that was pretty much all I could make. <laughs> um, I've expanded since then. Um, so I made brownies to take on this camping trip and then we can, <laughs> we can get there. <laughs> And we go to eat the brownies and they are bricks. They're completely inedible. They're horrible. Aww. Even if you can like <laughs> bite into them. For some reason, I had doubled the baking soda and not added any leavening to it. So they were like, they were bricks. They were oh. not even the birds would eat them. We tried to feed them to the birds. It was oh, horrible. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. So being really, really careful with baking soda and baking powder is, is something that I learned. I, yeah. I learned from the failure. <laughs> they do different so things. <laughs> they, they totally do. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's amazing. So no brownies on that camping trip. <laughs> no. And I got to tell you, my family loves brownies. So it was, it was a big disappointment. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so if you had to choose a completely new profession, what would you pick? <laughs> huh. I always thought being a university professor would be nice, but I don't know what I would be a professor of. Um, although I do get to guest lecture at a university next month. So I'm super excited about that. Oh, really fun. What are you lecturing yeah. on? Proposals. It's for, of a, course. <laughs> a, um, it's for a business school communications class. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd probably be a professor because the hours aren't bad if you're once you get tenure, it kind of, it's harsh unless you're tenure track and until you get tenure, it's harsh. Um, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we need some proposal tracks in universities. So I love it. <laughs> well, I gotta say a lot of folks who used to do journalism tracks, they need something else to do with their massive English skills. So I think there's a big opening there. Not that we don't yeah. still need great journalists, but yeah. there's less jobs. Fewer jobs Fewer for jobs. sure. <laughs>
Um, so what's the most interesting thing that you've read or seen this week? <laughs> I had a red team this week. <laughs> <laughs> what else have I read? Ah. <laughs> uh. We have this thing in our family where basically over breakfast, we read in each other's faces. So we're reading our news magazine for the kid. We're reading the newspaper and about every five to 10 minutes, somebody's like, oh, hey, did you see this? And so that way we cover all the gamuts. I'm like, I can't particularly remember one though. Um, well, that's a fun way. I'm fun reading. Video. Oh, I am reading. I'm halfway through. I need to finish. Um there's this book it won a prize back in the 70s when it came out and it's called beautiful swimmers hmm. it's about crabbing in the chesapeake bay oh gosh yeah <laughs> but, but it's but it's written by a former journalist so it has that like it has really good flow to it and it's mm -hmm. beautifully written like sometimes just like the words are great oh. uh, kind of like pat conroy he wrote a cookbook and it's fun to read because it's like <laughs> he just his phrasing is just good yeah like, the story might not even be that great but like the phrasing is good it's it's one of those books i really like it i learned a lot like there's four thousand miles of coastline on the chesapeake cool. bay who knew who knew wow yeah. so i'm sure there's lots of cool facts in it because it was written by a journalist <laughs> yeah but it's also it's just nicely done it's like it's yeah. just really it's a nice easy read cool i'll we'll have to check that one out you said beautiful swimmers. Yes. Um, so what is your favorite TV show? <laughs> uh, I switched to just binging like everyone else. Uh huh. So, uh, so what are you currently binging? Oh, I'm on the search for a new one. I was oh. trying, I was trying to get Ted Lasso because of course everybody's talking about it, but uh -huh. I refused to buy another service because we you. have like four. Um, We're in the same boat. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just hard. I'm trying to think of the last thing that I really liked. Um, I like Ozark. <laughs> We're delightful. waiting for that next dark. season to come out. <laughs> yeah, I tend to yeah, I tend to watch really dark stuff in the evenings. Yeah. Which is strange because several friends have compared me to a daffodil because I'm like cheery <laughs> and optimistic. So yeah, huh? Well, my flip side, I watch really, really dark movies and TV shows. Very interesting factoid there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were attending a Halloween party, what would your costume be and why? So I'm throwing a costume birthday party on Saturday for my daughter. And I am going as the Wicked Spider Lady. Ah, because I hate spiders. They creep me out. Yeah. So we have giant spiders going out on our lawn and I have a spider, like a big spider headband <laughs> and I'm going to have fake spiders on my clothes. It's going to be really horrifying, but yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Creepy. <laughs> Very creepy. All right. Well, we're going to pivot over to our gratitude round. Um, you've mentioned a few, but who are the people who've been the most influential in your life and career? Um, let's see. We talked about Molly Gimmel, mm -hmm. not only for helping me get that, that first job in a small consulting firm and expand my horizons a bit, um, but also she invited me to this Executive Women's Book Club that for years was a major sanity force in my life. Um, yeah. So I've read pretty much any major business book that's come out in the last <laughs> probably 10 years. Um, but I also have this amazing net network of like kick butt women who run their own companies or are super senior managers at other companies. And it, they're just tremendous. We seriously have to have a reunion sometime soon. Um, <laughs> And then let's see, we talked about Sotolongo a lot. Big <laughs> shout out to David Sotolongo, who's now at DHL running their BD shop. Um, and then Nancy Kessler and Howard Nutt. Um, Howard was the first person I knew to talk seriously about metrics. Um, and so uh, I have 
been very supportive of BDCMM <laughs> since the beginning. Um, and I had the pleasure uh, probably six, seven years ago now, um, he and Nancy were in, in town. And so we went out to dinner at an Italian place just to catch up because I hadn't seen them in a while. Um, this was well before he passed away. But uh, they, they made the comment. I'm like, but you guys have done this and you guys have done that. And he's like, yeah, he's like, but I'm retiring and now it's time for you <laughs> to step up. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, it felt like an anointing. And I'm like, it's one of those reasons why I still feel compelled to support APMP and to present and try to come up with interesting things to write about occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, just to carry on with what what they and David and Steve Shipley and everyone else have built and have, have really been taking to the next level over the last decade. It's been really interesting to see the evolution of the organization. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so what have you observed lately that reminded you that people are good? <laughs> um, this morning I saw a struggling monarch butterfly on the asphalt out front when I was walking the dog and I came in and told my daughter there's an animal emergency <laughs> and she immediately went and got dressed and threw on shoes and a sweater and went out and made up some a sugar water mixture for this poor butterfly <laughs> Aww. And then researched if that wasn't enough, where else he should be to be better camouflaged and were anything still blooming in our yard of interest to a butterfly. So that just made me feel really good. <laughs> That's so sweet. Uh, yeah. So who is the kindest person that you know? I think uh, I'm lucky. I have a lot of kind people surrounding me yeah. who remind me to be kind. <laughs> I need reminding. Um, my friend Stephanie Hendricks comes to mind. Mm. I met her at that first job out of college, and we have been fast friends since. And she lives in Georgia now. She's the one who made the sweet potato pie. Mm. Um, but she, she is just always trying to make other people's lives better. Mm. She's just very sweet. She sounds amazing. <laughs> Uh, so what is one personal trait that you like most about yourself? Um, it shouldn't be. I'm like, I like to learn things. Ah, that's a good one for sure. Yeah. All right. So we're down to our final four questions. Uh, what is one common myth about our profession that you want to debunk? It's just writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it really, it really is proposal management in miniature on a super fast deadline. For sure, for sure. Uh, what is one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Probably that BD or working on bids was actually a potential career field. Absolutely. I think so many people can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, so I think you may have answered this already, but let's make sure what is the best piece of advice you've received and who gave that to you? So I had an executive coach when I was at RTI and I can't remember his name. He was, he was great. Um, but we talked about influence without authority, which is there's some formal training I training I'd taken at Fidelity from the American Management Association on Influence Without Authority. Highly recommend that. But he really talked about making sure you're stating why you need something or why you're asking something or why something's important, the why, mm -hmm. and ask questions. Like you can ask questions to better understand. You can ask questions to get people to consider taking ownership of an idea that you want them to have. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, but asking questions are a super powerful tool in many, many ways. And you can ask questions at any seniority level and really have a tremendous impact just by asking. Yeah, I think we had similar training at one of my organizations and they called it coaching conversations. And it's oh, that yeah. art of asking questions to get them to come to the answer you need them to come to. 
Yeah, that's good. I'll look that one up. Um, so you've achieved so much to date. We are curious, what's next for you? What are you looking forward to in the future? Yeah, <laughs> I, think <that's> something, <laughs> I think that's something a lot of people are struggling with. Um, Everybody has been kind of like reorienting after our big pause of COVID or quasi pause. Um, and I, I had taken off most of the year to keep the family sane with homeschooling and everything else. So as we've been restarting, well, we're, we're, we're solidly restarted Hollywood and Associates at this point, but thinking through, do I want to take on another executive role that can have a tremendous positive impact? Or do I want to take Hollywood and Associates back up to scale? I'm not sure which direction it's going to be, but I'm, I'm exploring both right now. Wow. Very exciting options. Both of those. Thanks. <laughs> um, so is there anything that you had hoped to share today that we haven't touched upon? Um, I think you hit the main pieces. Those were a lot of good <laughs> questions. And I know I droned on about the career path. So. Oh, no, no. It was amazing hearing about all those different achievements and the different um, milestones at each organization. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It really has been a privilege to have you with us at Scribble Talk. We wish you all the good health and happiness. Please continue to inspire bid and proposal industry colleagues and everyone else around you. Stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy. You as well. Thanks, Thanks for including me in your Scribble Talks. <laughs> thank you, Christy. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Baska Sundrum. Signing off.